All right, so now we're moving into some really serious microeconomics. That's what we're going to be looking at here for the next few weeks anyway. Microeconomics, remember, is the study of the, of the smaller components of the economy, but they're not unimportant. So we don't want to make that, that error in saying that, well, it's just the smaller stuff, so it doesn't matter that much. That's not true at all. In fact, it might be that the smaller parts of the economy are actually the most important because the smaller parts are the, the parts really that make the economy as a whole work. So we're going to be focusing our attention now specifically on business decision making, but the lessons that we're going to learn here certainly apply to individual decisions as well. So we're going to start off with what is probably the most, um, I don't know, vilified idea in economics, perhaps, at least politically speaking. We're going to start off by looking at profits. Profits are, well, you could consider them the most important incentive in all of business. A lot of times you will hear politicians uh, say that businesses need to pay more tax. Well, th what they're saying is they need to pay more tax on their profits, but that can be misinterpreted to say businesses should have to pay more taxes on their revenues. So here's the first thing I want you to understand, and that is that revenues and profits are not the same thing. To understand that, I think we need to take a look at what it really means to earn a profit. So for example, Amazon, um, they're profitable, but their revenues far outpace their profits. And sometimes their profits are such that the company doesn't have to pay any tax at all, at least any corporate income tax. And that's where politicians get all kind of bent out of shape. When we're talking about profits, we're talking about a very specific concept. So let's kind of peel back that definition here a little bit and try to understand what it means, what a profit means, and why profits are so vital in a market economy. So previously, we talked about um, some of the basic ideas in economics. One of those ideas was the idea of an opportunity cost, and that's the value of what you have to give up in order to get or to do something else. So we talked about um, you know, just the idea of getting out of bed. So if you're going to get out of bed at a certain time, it means you have to give up some extra sleep. Or if you're going to study harder for the economics exam, it means maybe you don't have the chance to go, uh, go out with your friends. Opportunity costs. Every choice we make entails an opportunity cost. We also made, the, I made mention of the idea of decisions being made at the margin. So instead of deciding whether to study at all for your test, you decide whether to study one more hour. Or instead of deciding um, to eat one more donut, you decide or to whether to eat donuts at all, you decide I'm going to eat one more donut. So those are decisions at the margin, those incremental changes. And we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at margins here. This is where, so this is sort of the, the part of class where margins start to make a huge uh, appearance, to make an appearance anyway. Specialization, we mentioned, allows individuals to increase their production. So we talked about that in the context of Batman and Robin. So Batman specializes in one type of crime fighting. Robin specializes in another type of crime fighting. They have their comparative advantages, and they just do those things so that the crime fighting duo can be more productive than they would have been on their own. And then finally, we talked about markets. Most recently, we talked about markets and how markets provide good and goods and services to buyers who value them the most. And markets are incre incredibly efficient because markets generate the most total surplus, that consumer surplus and producer surplus. Markets seeking equilibrium will maximize those surpluses. So that's just a little bit of what we've done in the class up till now. And these things are all going to be part of and important parts of our understanding of productions, production and costs and profit. So, so we might think we know what profit means. We think, oh, that's when businesses make money. But that's not, that's only half the story. 
and certainly profits involve making money. But the part that most people forget about, the part that, that people forget about when it comes to how much money should Amazon pay in taxes is the cost side of profits. So let's now take a look first of all at what profits do and then we'll start to understand the, the, the calculation of profits. So what do profits do for us? Well, first of all, to earn a profit, a firm has to produce products or services that people are willing to pay for. We, so we kind of alluded to this when we, were when we were talking about markets. We said that markets involve buyers and sellers. So here's a buyer and here's a seller. Uh, I guess we need to distinguish these folks somehow. So we'll say here's the seller and we'll say that this is the buyer. Well, you have to have both of these in order to have a market. So it's incumbent upon the seller to have something that the buyer wants. So let's just give them something here. We'll, we'll just put some letters here. So this is something that the buyer wants to have. And the more the buyer wants to have this thing, the better it is for the seller because it might actually attract more buyers. And that's good for the seller. They all want this thing. A lot of, a lot of times though, that's where the understanding of buying and selling stops. But we need to dig a little bit deeper. If all of these people want this thing that the seller has, then the seller can sell those things. And then, so here's some money that the buyers are willing to pay. And the seller trades this thing to the buyers and ends up with a bunch of money over here. This is great for the seller. But if the seller wants to continue to sell things to buyers, they're going to have to take this money and use it, not just on their own interests and on their own wants, but they're going to have to take this money and put it into their business so that they can produce more things. If they can't make enough money from selling their product, then they're not going to be able to make any more because there's something else going on in this whole relationship between buyers and sellers. So the second thing we need to know is that the products and services that the firm produces, those generate revenue. That's those dollar signs that we saw. But then we also have to understand that if the firm is going to produce output, they need things, inputs, to produce their output. Sometimes we call these inputs factors of production. So to produce the output, the firm takes these factors of production, combines them, and then sells the output to the buyers. That's the stuff the buyers want. Now in economics, we think very, um, we categorize the inputs very loosely. I mean, we could come up with a list of inputs you know, 10 miles long if we specified every single input into the production process. Instead, what we do is we, we, we categorize these things very broadly. So think about the things that you would use if you were a business to produce an output. What are some of the basic things you would need to produce output? Well, I can hear some of you 
sort of shouting at your computer screens. You have to have workers. And you absolutely do have to have workers. We call the workers, and anything really that is attributable to workers, we call this labor. Labor involves clearly the physical labor. So you need people. But we also include here something that we call human capital. This is part of the worker. And more and more, it's the human capital that's really, really important in the business field. In fact, one of the reasons why you are at college right now is to help develop this aspect of labor, the human capital. Human capital is, is kind of a nebulous concept in and of itself. It includes things like education. One of the reasons people get one of the people reasons people go to college is so that they can earn a higher income. And one of the reasons people who have college degrees earn a higher income is because they bring more human capital to the job. But we could also include just general skills that you have. So as you work more, you develop skills. Uh, we could uh, include here um, innovations that you bring to a job. We could include things like uh, the ideas that people have. Pretty much anything that goes along with humans or their um, intellectual uh, skill sets, just their um, just kind of entire package that a worker brings is involved and comes under the heading of labor. And again, you can see here how so many things could be listed individually as as attributes that you need to have in the production process. But we don't want to talk about all of those things. We really just want to say, hey, you know what? You need workers. And sometimes you need their physical capabilities, and sometimes you need their intellectual capabilities. So labor, that's one thing, one factor of production. A second factor of production, some of you might be thinking, well, okay, yeah, workers, that's fine. What else do you need to make products? And some of you might have come up with the idea, well, well, you need, um, oh, yeah, remember we had that little picture just a couple slides ago. You need, you need a place to, to build things. You need a, a location. You need, um, you need a factory. And maybe you need tools and machines and um so that, that's something else you would need, and that's absolutely true. We would label that under the heading of capital. Capital are, this is probably the most wide ranging of the inputs into the production process. Capital is really the man-made things used in the production process. The man-made things used in the production process. So clearly, we've got our factories. But any kind of a tool that you would need, so there's hammers, um, soldering guns, um, computers, those are man-made. And so many businesses use computers, of course, that's considered capital. Um, any kind of a machine that you use, that would be considered capital. In fact, we could even really throw money in here because it's man-made and it's used in the production process. But money in itself is kind of a weird thing to think about. Um, because money isn't used to make anything. Money is used to acquire the tools that are used to help make other things. So we're not really, this is not money in terms of capital. We're, money, is, th these are the physical things that you need to make stuff. And anything, um, anything that you need to make a product, a final good or service, falls under the heading of capital. So that's the second input. We have labor. We have capital. Some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If, if we have, have man-made things, what about the non-man-made things? What about the stuff that we just get from nature? There's lots of things that we get from nature. Um, 
but about things like trees and and minerals and and water and sunlight if you're talking about uh, replenish uh, talking about like uh, solar energy or any of those kind of things yeah those are all things that we need to make stuff but we're not going to list every single one of them again we would be here forever making lists instead we're just going to call this category very generally land and land are your natural resources the things that man doesn't make the natural resources so your your land your your physical location for the factory just the um, real estate if you want to think about it that way um, but any kind of uh, products that come from nature, so whether it's coal, whether it is, um, whether they're diamonds, whether it's gold, whether it's um, copper, what, whatever, water, anything that comes from nature, that's considered land. So those are three big inputs into the production process, land, labor, and capital. They are not the only inputs into the production process. We have one more on our list, but... This last input into the production process is, is a little bit hard to, uh, to identify. It, it's easy to see labor. It's easy to see the people working. It's easy to see capital. That's the machinery that they're working with. And it's pretty easy to see the land as well. But this last input into the production process, it's sort of a newcomer to the list because for a long time in economics, we didn't think about it as so important and so necessary, but it is. It's absolutely fundamentally necessary for production to take place. The other reason that we, we don't really think about it on its own is because it is an attribute of people, but it's an attribute that's really hard to... Um, it's hard to create. It's hard to generate. People will go to school and they'll think they know, they think they can learn about this attribute, but it doesn't mean that they have it. Uh, not everybody has this particular characteristic about themselves. In fact, if we look at countries and their production around the world, we can see instances where when this particular element is missing, then the production process in a country is, is going to be fundamentally flawed. That last, the last and perhaps most important of all the inputs into the production process is something we call entrepreneurship. 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 These are um, entrepreneurs are the people who basically think up a business. They bring the other inputs into the production process together and actually do something with them. These uh, entrepreneurship can be defined variously. One way I like to define it is the risk takers or the risk taking ability. And I don't mean you know, driving 100 miles per hour down a down a two-lane road. That's not the risks I'm talking about here, or jumping out of an airplane. What I'm talking about with risk-taking ability is just the the willingness and the and the confidence to step out and say, I'm going to risk these inputs, and I'm going to risk putting these inputs together in an improper way because I think I'm putting them together in a way that people will value. So entrepreneurship is risk-taking ability, but it's also organizational ability. It's the ability to combine land, labor, and capital into something valuable. Entrepreneurs are not just Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. They're, they're legion in our country and, and around the world. There are people who say, hey, I've got an idea. I'm going to put it into practice. I have, a, I have a friend who started a business and it's doing spectacularly well. What he did was he saw a need in the market for a certain kind of pharmaceutical. And he said, well, why don't we make that? And the answer was, well, there's not a, you know, there's no market for it. And he says, of course, there's a market for it. Let's 
step in and fill that market. And many people didn't believe he could be successful at it, and he proved them wrong. He had the organizational ability and the risk-taking ability to step in and, and do a job and do it really well. I have another friend who started a business. It's not nearly as successful monetarily, but he did the same thing. He stepped in and he saw a need for a service that wasn't being provided. He designs buildings and he designs um, structures. He's not an engineer so much as he's a he's a designer. He 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 um he's sort of a, a self-taught architect and he does a good business for himself. He's able to feed his family and take care of himself. He's an entrepreneur as well. Entrepreneurs are these people who take risks, who see a need in the market. And we could maybe think of them like this. They're the ideas people. And they're also the people who can put these things into practice. And you need entrepreneurs. The example um, that I think is probably most poignant and most um, tangible is the idea of a country who has lots of land and lots of labor and lots of capital, but they don't have any entrepreneurs to bring all these things together. And without those entrepreneurs, then it doesn't matter how much of the other stuff you have. You need the entrepreneur to have the vision to bring all this stuff together. So those are our four factors of production, labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship. You need all of them in order to produce things effectively and to produce things that people actually want. All right, just to review, remember, labor are the workers and their skills. Land is the geographic location and the resources, the natural resources. Capital are the man-made resources that are needed to create the final good or, or service. And then entrepreneurship is that specialized ability, that, uh, that person who can combine these other factors of production. So that brings us back to profits. Profits do a lot of really important things in the economy. Most important of all of these things, though, is probably providing a financial incentive. It gives someone the reason for being in business. Say, I want to I want to be my own boss. Yeah, that's great. But if you can't make any money at it, it doesn't matter what you want. Profits provide the financial incentive to step out and take a risk. But profits also help us to allocate resources. Remember, resources are scarce. So if you don't have some mechanism to allocate resources, then what's going to happen is that people are going to use resources wastefully. Profits help to make sure that the, the things that consumers want are the things that are produced rather than some crazy idea that a supplier has or a business has to produce something that nobody wants. Profits help us to allocate resources. And then finally, and perhaps most distressingly, profits help to determine who's going to stay in business and who's going to fail. That's not always a pleasant thing to think about, but profits are there to identify the winners and the losers. So let's take a look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. I think it's really important that we understand the functions and the roles that profits play because so, so often uh, in the media we hear that profits are a bad thing or that profits are ill-gotten or that somebody doesn't deserve the, the financial rewards for their hard work. If we go down that path, though, we still need a reason for someone to step into the business world and produce something. We need another form of incentive. And there aren't really good suggestions as to what that other incentive should be. There's not really a good backup plan. So if we get rid of profits, what are we left with? Well, nobody's really offered that solution. So we, it's important that we understand why profits exist, to be sure, but that they're not evil. They're, they're just a tool that we use to incentivize and motivate behavior and to make sure that in the process of dealing with scarcity, people are able to deal with scarcity in a way that helps them out the most. 
So let's explore the, those three things, those three roles that prophets play uh, in, in more detail now. So this is a picture, or at least a, an artist's rendition, of the pirate Blackbeard. Blackbeard was, by many accounts, the most fearsome pirate in all of, all of the pirating world. Uh, he would you know, strap bandoliers of bullets and guns all over his body. He would, at, at various times, put, like, uh, put candles and light them, put them in his beard to look as fearsome as possible and as crazy as possible. And one of the reasons Blackbeard did this was in part because he was, let's face it, a little bit crazy, but also because he wanted to earn as much profit as possible. That's not usually the thing that people think about when it comes to the crazy pirates. But if we think about why people become pirates or engage in crime or change answers on tests, in other words, cheat on tests, or why they engage in, uh, why they enter businesses that seem at first blush to be utterly horrible, we have to fall back on there's got to be a, a motivating factor. And in part, it's financial. In large part, it's financial. I've got a, a friend who runs a business and they clean up crime scenes and they clean up biohazards. And right now his business is booming because he also cleans up COVID stuff. Or he uh, disinfects areas that have been exposed to the COVID virus. That's a dangerous job. Why would he do that? And the answer is, ah, there's that financial incentive. The financial incentive that comes from profits. If we want people who are going to do jobs, maybe you've seen the show uh, Worst Jobs in, in the World or Worst Jobs in America or whatever, whatever the title of the show is, or Dangerous Jobs. Those are things that most normal people are not going to want to, they don't grow up saying, oh, mommy, I want to have a business that cleans up biohazards. That's not the way people typically grow up. Those aren't the ideas that they have when they're young. But if there's a profit to be had, then people will pursue those kinds of jobs. There are financial incentives for people to engage in those dangerous, dirty, nasty, horrible jobs that they otherwise would not have any interest in pursuing. So profits are really, really important. They provide a financial incentive to get people to um, you know, go deep sea fishing, to get people to work in underwater uh, oil rigs, to get people to clean up biohazards, and to get people to, to pursue certain activities that they wouldn't do voluntarily. The second role that profits play is the role of allocating resources. And this is a little bit more complicated. Remember, when we look at markets, markets serve to allocate scarce resources to those willing to pay for them. So again, just to drive this point home, markets are allocating goods and services to the people who are willing to pay for them. So the willingness to pay is sending a signal. The willingness to pay sends a signal that, that is, hey, I want this stuff. And how much do you how much do I want it? Well, I'm willing to pay you to make it for me. So if buyers value the products that sellers want, and if those sellers have specialized skills or need specialized materials, things that are expensive to acquire then in order to get that final product, buyers are going to have to pay higher prices to get those things. So if you want a car, you can go down to the car dealership and get a car. If you want a, a car that is a little bit more than your average car, a very specialized, limited run one that is hand stitched with hand stitched leather and one where the the parts in the motor have been hand handmade then you're going to have to pay more for that because it requires incredibly specialized skills and specialized materials and we know that people want these these special kinds of vehicles because they're willing to pay hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to acquire them and if people weren't willing to pay, then the market's not going to produce those things. 
Now, because we know that people are willing to pay for those status symbol vehicles, then the producers are going to have to acquire the resources to get them. And to acquire those resources, it's going to require a higher price. So this willingness to pay gives the producer the ability to charge prices high enough to cover the costs of producing this thing. Again, if you're talking about a specialized car, the skills that are required to build that vehicle by hand are incredibly limited. And so to entice someone into acquiring those skills in the first place, you have to pay them a lot of money. You need someone who's willing to pay so that the producer is incentivized to acquire the skills in the first place. So profits help us to allocate resources. They help us to get, they help to incentivize individuals to acquire these very specialized skills or to acquire these specialized inputs so that they can provide a good that someone is clearly willing to pay for. Thus, the limited resources are allocated to those products that are most valued. That idea that you're providing something that's most valued is, is really, it's kind of a loaded statement. Um, you say, you may think to yourself, well, Society doesn't really value a handmade car. They, you know, go out and buy a Ford that comes off the assembly line. Why do we need those things? Those very specialized, very expensive things. And the answer is, we don't need them, but we want them. And if people want those things and they are willing to pay for them, then it is, it's the profit motive, it's the profit incentive that's going to divert resources away from the Ford assembly line and into the hands of some fine Italian car maker. It's the, um, it's the profit that helps to allocate those resources to those, to those specialized producers. And we know someone values those things. They value a, um, a special edition car over a Ford Taurus, or a, even a Ford F-150. So the resources don't go en masse to the specialized producer, but they are diverted from the assembly line to those specialized producers because someone values them. They value those things a lot. They're willing to pay, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars to acquire that thing. That's one of the roles that profits play. They allocate resources away from the assembly line and to some specialized production. Maybe putting it in a more um, kind of basic way of thinking about this. Here are two superheroes. On the one side we have Matter Eater Lad. Very few people have ever heard of Matter Eater Lad. Um, more people have heard of the guy on the right. The Man of Steel, Superman. Now the thing about these two characters is that they were created by the same guy, Jerry Siegel. Jerry um, had, a, had enormous success with Superman and wanted to keep the ball rolling, so he created other superheroes, just not as famous superheroes. I mean, Matter Eater Lad is a guy who can eat matter. He can eat anything. Here he is eating a chain link fence, for example. But that's just not really that interesting and kind of gross if you think about it. Matter Eater Lad isn't as famous as Superman. And we know that because we don't hear about Matter Eater Lad. And the reason that Jerry Siegel devotes so much more of his attention and his resources to expanding the Superman universe is because Superman made money. And Matter Eater Lad didn't really make any money. We're diverting resources to telling the Superman story because there are profits to be made there. Again, to reiterate and reinforce this idea that profits move resources, profits help to allocate resources. Here is something I wish I could say was in my basement. Stacks of gold bars, that would be awesome. But they're not. They do not exist in my basement or any other part of my house or any part of my property. Gold is a really valuable resource, of course. Gold is used in the production of a lot of different things. 
gold is a an incredible conductor of electricity. So in your cell phone, in your smartphone, in your computer, probably in your car, there are little tiny bits of gold. Not enough to rip the phone apart and pull the gold out. You're not going to, that's no good for you. But gold helps to conduct electricity. It helps to, to move that information through the circuitry of your phones. Gold's also really great for your teeth. If you need fake teeth, gold fits the bill. Gold is also a really good, it, it's involved in, or it's included in the production of certain high-end windows because it eliminates the UV rays. It, it kind of filters them out. Gold is really, really good, in uh, a really good, um, part of the production process in a lot of different ways. It's a really important part of the production process in a lot of different ways. So the question is, when it comes to using gold, how do we decide where the gold should be, should go? Should it be used in your teeth? Should it be used in jewelry? Should it be used in circuitry? And the answer is, well, it just depends on who's willing to pay the most for it. And we know who's willing to pay the most for it based on the markets and the market transactions that people are involved with. Gold moves from one part of the market to another relatively seamlessly. It follows the people who are willing to pay the most for it. And the people who are willing to pay the most for it are the ones who are selling goods and services that consumers actually want and are willing to pay for. So that that allocation of goods and services, that allocation of, of inputs is driven by the profit motive. Why do we use gold in circuitry instead of something else? There are other things that are good conductors of electricity, but gold is better than most of them. So we have gold show up in cell phones and smartphones because people want smartphones and they want them to work well and fast and efficiently. So gold is put into those smartphones because it's such a great conductor. And it's the profits that companies like Apple and Samsung are making that allow them to acquire the gold that's needed to for those uh, for that um, for the production of those phones. So we have two of our functions of profits: the incentive, and we have the allocation of resources. Again, those are so vital. Profits help to move resources around. They help things to happen more efficiently. But that last role of profits, that's a tough one. It's, it's the, um, perhaps what gives profits the bad name. So let's take a look at that. And to take a look at that, I wanna start off with this picture. This is a picture of a dessert, perhaps the world's most expensive dessert. It was served at a restaurant called Serendipity, I think it was Serendipity 2, in New York City. It's basically an ice cream sundae. Um, and on top of the ice cream sundae, you see a kind of a chocolate truffle. And this thing right here, and they get a little extra one here in this little box. This is a special kind of Swiss chocolate or Belgian chocolate, whatever it is, it's you know, ridiculously expensive. And then sprinkled on top of this ice cream sundae was, was gold dust. Now in part, Serendipity wanted to have this on the menu um, as, a, as a way to attract customers, kind of curious customers. They actually sold one of these and it was something like $10,000. The problem for Serendipity though, was that they didn't do a really good job at providing things that people actually wanted to buy. This is a curiosity, but they still had to acquire this really expensive chocolate and this really, well, you know, gold dust isn't a dime a dozen. So they had to spend a lot of their resources to acquire inputs that people didn't want to buy. And consequently, Serendipity went out of business they weren't able to cover the cost of production. They weren't able to make a profit. And when you can't make a profit, you're not gonna be in business very long. And that's the third role of profits. Profits determine who's going to be success, successful 
and who's not going to be successful. Profits determine who stays in business and who does not. Profits are a signal that a company is producing products or services that are valued by the public, that are valued by people and that they're willing to pay for those things. Without that signal, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to identify where resources should go. And it's really difficult, if not impossible, for businesses to produce the things that consumers actually want to have because they don't have the right information. If they see, currently, if they see that people are willing to pay more for face masks, businesses are going to turn their attention to producing those things. If they see that consumers are, have this desire for more hand sanitizer, businesses are going to produce more of those things. You've probably heard stories of alcohol distilleries who, in the middle of the pandemic, said, you know, we're going to move resources to out of producing alcoholic drinks and moving it to hand sanitizer. Here's one uh, uh, Bar Hill distilleries from Vermont. They have their gin and they have their hand sanitizer. They made this transition in very small part because they wanted to help people. It was more a profit-driven decision because people weren't able to get to the distillery to buy the alcoholic beverage, but they could buy the hand sanitizer. Profits were sending that signal. Hey, you can reallocate your resources to areas where people will pay and we will be able to cover your costs. Profits sent that signal and as a result, we have basically the country is awash in hand sanitizer now. There's more than we could possibly need. Profit sent that signal. Now, when economies are doing really well, lots of companies can earn profit. When consumers have lots of income, they're out buying all kinds of things. But when economies go badly, when things shut down, companies that are not earning profits go out of business. This is the big problem during the pandemic for most businesses. When businesses aren't allowed to be open, they can't earn any money. And if they can't earn any money, they can't cover any costs that they have. And if they can't cover their costs, they can't earn a profit. And if they don't earn a profit, they may go out of business. Companies that aren't earning profits go out of business. And there's only so long you can hang on not earning a profit. Profits do determine the winners and the losers in economies. And one of the more dramatic examples of this are two companies that essentially did the same thing for years and years and years. Amazon is really just a new version of Sears. Sears and Roebuck, uh, the original company, was a mail order company. They just didn't have the internet. That's really what Amazon is. It's a mail order company on the internet. They're really good at shipping things. And Sears was really good at shipping things. You get the Sears catalog, you find what you want, you write to the company or you fill out a form, you say, these are the things that I want, and they would send them to you. But Sears hasn't earned a profit in a very long time. And they're not around anymore. And Amazon, which is really just the new Sears, there's your winner. They're the company that earns the profits, whereas Sears did not. Sears is out of business. Profits determine who stays in business. Profits determine who gets the resources that are needed to produce things that consumers want. And because of that, profits have this reputation of being... <sighs> Well, evil, I guess. Profits determine who wins and who loses, and that's sometimes not seen as fair. But again, we need to have a mechanism by which we get uh, inputs to the people who are going to use them most effectively. We don't, as harsh as it sounds, we don't want companies like Sears or, say, JCPenney or um, 
even behemoths like General Electric, we don't want them just knocking about, using up resources if they're not being effect if they're not efficiently producing things, if they're not producing things that people want to have. A dynamic economy requires that we have this, um, well, almost what's almost this destructive process. In fact, it's called in economics creative destruction. We need this creative destructive creatively destructive process if we want economies to move forward. I think about this. If any company on the verge of failure was protected from failing, it means we would have to divert resources to that company. So say you're, um, say that you have a, a telephone, one of the old telephones with a rotary dial on it. There are companies that would produce those telephones. And if that company's on the verge of going out of business because everybody in the market wants to buy a, a smartphone, should we protect that company because they're not earning profits anymore? Or should we protect the uh, horse and buggy industry or the blacksmith industry or the newspaper industry? Now, those are all those are all businesses that have hired in the course of time tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. But it, those industries change. We don't get our, most of us do not get our, our, we don't take phone calls on rotary phones. We don't, um, we don't watch VHS tapes anymore. We don't watch, it's a lot of times people don't even watch cable anymore. They're streaming their television. They don't read their news in the newspaper. They get it online. Those businesses, those industries go out of business because they're not providing things people want anymore. Profits send the signal to get them out of the way. Get those, get those businesses out of here. And should we continue, should we protect those industries and protect those jobs? Or should we let the economy change as it normally changes? That's, that's something that profits help us to do more effectively rather than have a group of people sitting in a room determining what the winner, who the winners and losers are. Markets determine that. And the markets receive signals from us as consumers. So profits are really, really, really important. They may not seem fair, but that's not what profits are supposed to do. Profits are supposed to send signals. They're supposed to provide incentives. And they're supposed to help us allocate resources efficiently and quickly I mean, it could be done, at least in theory, through a government mechanism, but it's going to take forever. And if government started to pick the winners and losers in industry, as opposed to having profits do that, then there's a, now a political aspect to business that might be untenable. So the point here is that profits are important. We want profits uh, to be able to do the job that profits are doing. They're not evil. They're just they're messages. They're signals. And profits are really effective signals. So profits are very effective signals, but we haven't really looked at how you calculate a profit yet. So let's take a look now at the um, at the numbers behind profits. What? How do you go about calculating a profit? Well, profits are made up of two parts, and the first part is the one that most people think about when they think about profits. That's the total revenue. The total revenue is the amount a firm receives from the sale of the goods and services that they produce. But if you just stop there, you're missing the picture on profits. In fact, you're, you're not dealing with profits at all. Because profits include the total cost of doing business. And the total cost is the amount a firm spends in order to produce the goods and services that it sells to consumers. So profits are the difference between total revenues and total costs. A profit occurs when the total revenue is greater than the total cost. In other words, when you do your calculation and the number ends up being positive, that's a profit. Losses occur, and this is bad for business, when the total revenues are not enough to cover your total costs. In other words, when the total revenue is less than the total cost. Now, if the numbers are equal to each other, in other words, if total revenue equals total cost, we have what's called break-even. And 
you may think that, well, break-even may not be great, and it would be better to earn a profit, but break-even isn't that bad of a thing. We'll talk more about breaking even uh, later in the course. But when we look at profitability, what we're trying to figure out is whether or not the total revenues are enough to cover the total cost, and hopefully they're more than the total cost. So again, profits occur when total revenue minus total cost is a positive number. Losses occur when, when it's a negative number. So let's take a look at some, some data here to, uh, to figure out, and to, to examine, get a feel here for what, um, what happens when a company is profitable. Let's say you run a restaurant and you sell hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes. Hamburgers sell at a dollar, french fries sell at two dollars, and milkshakes sell at two fifty. To determine the total revenue, all we do is take the price of the good that we're selling and multiply it times the quantity sold. So for hamburgers, we sell uh, 1,000 hamburgers at a price of one dollar. We multiply those two numbers and we get our revenue from that item. We do the same thing with french fries. So we take two dollars times 500, that equals a thousand dollars. And with milkshakes, we take two dollars and fifty cents multiply it by 100 units sold, that equals $2.50, and then we add all three of those numbers up. So 1,000 plus 1,000 plus 250 equals $2,250, and that is our total revenue. But that's not profit, because we haven't paid for any of our inputs, and our inputs do not just show up on the door, To work for free. We have to pay for our inputs. Those are part of our total costs. Our total costs include, but are not limited to, things like wages and food ingredients and napkins and straws and, and the things we use to wrap the food up with. Let's say that for a day, our revenues are $2,250 and our costs are $2,000. If that's the case, then we take the $2,250, that's our revenue, minus our costs of $2,000, and we get a positive $250. Positive number, this is good. The owner of the business takes those profits, they stick them in their pocket, walk out the door, think what a great day it is because we've made money. We've made a positive profit. Not only have we earned revenues, but we've earned enough revenues to cover our costs. That's good. But let's say we come in the next day, we sell exactly the same thing, but one of our inputs is now more expensive. And let's say instead that our total costs are $2,750, so our costs have gone up by $500, but our revenues haven't changed. In that case, we have $2,250, that's our revenue, so here's our total revenue, and we subtract our now higher total costs, and look what happens. Now we have a negative sign on that number. So our total revenues are less than total costs and now the business has a loss. In this case a loss of $500. That's how we calculate profits and losses. Now business success or failure does not depend upon what happens in a single day. Over the course of time businesses will compute what's going on with their total profits. So one day they're profitable, one day they're not. That doesn't mean the company's going out of business but it is something to pay attention to. Well, that makes it all sound like it's super easy to compute profits and losses, and that's not really the case. That's a little bit misleading. Revenues, though, are very easy. I mean, relatively speaking. Revenues are easy. When we look at revenues, we are looking at just the price times the quantity of what you sell. And, um, and again, it's pretty simple. You may sell a lot of different goods, so you have to do that calculation a couple of different times and add them all up. But for the most part, revenues are pretty straightforward. It's the costs where things get murky. 
And so I just want to warn you right now, we are beginning to dip our toes in the in the giant pool that is that is cost. I mentioned the idea of total cost, and, and it's almost a throwaway line. It's like, oh, it's just your total costs. But when we look at costs, there are lots and lots of different kinds of costs. And I don't mean wages, your electric bill, your cell phone plan, your rent. I don't mean that. I mean just different categories of costs. We're going to start off by breaking cost into two areas, two broader areas. But as we go forward and look at the, at the whole process of, of decision making, we're going to have a lot of different kind of costs to worry about. So I want to give you fair warning now. Total costs are probably the most obvious and easiest to understand. But there are different kinds of costs. And we're going to start looking at them now. We're going to start by looking at two uh, categories of costs, one called explicit, which are actually really easy, and the other implicit, which is a little bit more difficult, although we have kind of talked about them before. So let's get into those two different kinds of costs. The first of our kinds of costs are explicit. And again, those are the easy ones. Those are tangible. They're very obvious. They're the bills. So you get a bill for your cell phone. You get a wage bill. You've got your insurance. You've got um, your ingredients for your food. Those things where you have to write a check and say, hey, here you are. Thank you for, for giving me the, uh, um, the ice cream for the, for the milkshakes and the potatoes for the french fries. Explicit costs are obvious. And when accountants... When accountants can help businesses compute costs, these are the, really the only ones they're worried about, are the explicit costs. Implicit costs are a little bit less obvious. Implicit costs are basically the opportunity costs of doing business. Opportunity costs uh, are the things that you would have done if you didn't do the thing you do. Remember, they're the, they're the second best option. So you decide, oh, I'm going to sleep in today, and you skip econ class. Well, your opportunity cost is, is the econ class. But businesses have lots of opportunity costs as well. For example, what about the opportunity cost of capital or the money that you spend? If you buy a franchise, say a Dunkin' Donuts franchise, what could you have used that money for instead of buying the franchise? Maybe you could have bought a Chick-fil-A franchise, or maybe you could have sent your kid to college. Or maybe you could have just retired early. What are the things you could have done? Well, those are opportunity costs. And your next best option is a cost of using your money. And that is an implicit cost. There's also the opportunity cost of the owner's time above the salary that they're paid. So what could you have done if you would have taken your, taken your talents somewhere else? What could you have been paid doing something else? That's an opportunity cost. And it's not something that you get a receipt for. It's not something that you turn into your accountant. But it is an important idea if we want to make sure resources are being used efficiently. To give you a better picture of explicit and implicit costs, let's take a look at a, a rather relatively unusual source of information about running a business. This is a panel from a Deadpool comic. And Deadpool, in this particular issue, is trying to run a business. He's hired a bunch of workers to dress up like him and go out and kind of save the day for a fee. And his employees have just returned from, a, um, from an escapade, and they haven't been paid. In fact, Deadpool has arranged that the people that they have helped these imposter Deadpools have helped, don't have to pay in money. And they're a little bit upset by this. So you can see what this guy is saying. You're paying us half what we should be paid. Half. So Deadpool's cost, his explicit cost, is what he's paying as workers. It's not as much as they should be earning, but he is paying them. That is an explicit cost. And he says here, saving the world ain't cheap. What you're not making in money, you might make in fame. It's not cheap. There are costs to saving the world. And that's Deadpool's business. He wants to save the world. And he can't afford to do it, not yet, because his revenues aren't high enough to pay, first of all, his explicit cost, 
But what about his implicit cost? Here are the implicit costs, or one of the implicit costs of his business. This guy right here, sitting in the lounge chair, this is Deadpool's accountant. And he's been trying to talk to Deadpool about money and the things that are involved in running a business. He says, look, there's too much cash being diverted to the Avengers. So Deadpool has 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 another cost involved in running his business. It's not just paying his workers, but he has to pay this opportunity cost to the Avengers. Basically, he's paying them off to, to kind of allow him to run a business. And the, and the accountant says, you need to get this Merck business solvent soon. In other words, right now, Deadpool's total revenues are less than his total costs. And so he is currently insolvent. He's losing money. And the accountant says, you better not, you better get this business solvent soon or you're going to be out of business. You need to cover your, you have to pay your workers. You need to bring in revenue to cover your workers, but you also need to, to have revenue to pay these, these implicit costs, these other costs that are part of running a business where you could be just going to work for the Avengers instead of paying them, that's an implicit cost. What's your opportunity cost, Deadpool? You could be working for the Avengers instead of paying the Avengers. Okay, so those are just two different types of cost, implicit and explicit. Your total costs are the cost of running your business. So they include explicit and implicit costs. What we're going to do next time is we're going to start to put all of these pieces together to try to help us understand why businesses make the choices that they make, whether that is to produce more things or just to stay, keep their doors open. So we're going to start to apply more of the marginal thinking to the business world. But for now, I think that's enough to chew on. Um, just the idea of profits and the roles that profits play and, and the beginnings of an understanding of how, uh, how costs are part of such a, a vital role of understanding the decisions that we make.